You know, uh, when I was preparing this message, uh, I, I was debating over a couple titles, and I know that we are created to be blessed. I know that for a fact. God created us. We are His workmanship. He made us beautiful. We are the apple of His eye, according to the Bible. And I also thought that uh, when our blessings come, sometimes they come without us even knowing about them. Sometimes they come after we've asked for them. And most of our blessings will come after we have been obedient. I'm going to get to that here in a few minutes. But my other title, backup title for my message was Obedience Equals Blessings. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians 1, and just one short little verse. Verse 3. While you're finding that, I want to define a blessing for you. If I would define it, a blessing would be any expression of God's goodness and His love toward us. I mean, man, we're, we're blessed, sitting here blessed so much right now that we don't even realize it. Life, health, breath, strength, the very air that we have to breathe. I mean, man, we're, man, we're blessed. Man, we're blessed. Answered prayer. Miraculous provision. Unexpected favor. Or just some expressions of His love for us. Let's go ahead and read. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Let us pray. Lord, as we come before you once more, we're just so thankful, God, that you have gathered us as you have. God, we're blessed beyond measure. Sometimes we take it for granted. But God, I just want you to know right now, I'm blessed because of you. You have blessed me beyond what I deserve. You have blessed me more in my life than I ever dreamed of. And God, I realize that it has come from you. I realize this morning that I placed my little hand in your big hand. And you have led me and you've guided me and you've directed me. And when I've tried to pull and go to the, to the sides of the road and be through the bush, God, you still pulled me back on that paved road that you have for me. And God, just this morning, I just want us to realize the blessings that we have and, and how that they have come from you. And God, as we leave here in just a little while, God, once again, just, just let us realize that, God, we can be better each day through you. We can grow closer to you. We can be Christ-like, and that's what we are to strive for. But help us to be a better Christian when we walk out those doors than we was when we walked in those doors while ago. And God, for all these things, I'm never going to fail to bow my head and thank you for them. God, I just ask that you would bless the message and the messenger just one more time. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen. 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 You know, He chooses to bless us in different ways. He chooses, uh, sometimes we can easily recognize His blessings and sometimes we don't recognize them even enough to thank Him for them. But He grants us strength in the midst of hardship. He uses our suffering to mature us spiritually. And when we obey God, we can trust that He is doing what He is doing for our benefit. Amen. For our future. He looks at my tomorrow and prepares me for my tomorrow today. Amen. He's doing that to you right now. When we obey God, we can trust Him that His goodness and mercies will follow and that He loves us. But you know, there's many biblical examples in the Bible of men and women 
who have experienced God's blessings through the midst of hardships, through the uh, endurance of suffering, and just plain obedience. And I want to mention just a few of those this morning. But in other words, doing what He tells us to do, as Wayne said, even when we don't want to do it or we don't think that is meant for us, and if we would do that, people would call us stupid or, wow, I can't believe he's even attempting to do something like that. But I, I want to mention to you about Noah. Noah, he was very obedient to God and his family was saved from the flood. Now I want to realize something to you all right now that it had never rained before. So when Noah was building a boat on dry ground, that ark, I mean, people was making fun of him. They was laughing at him and said, Noah, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building an ark. We're going to have a flood. He said, we don't have floods. We don't even have rain that you're talking about. We have dew that comes up and moistens the ground. We don't have this. Noah, you're off your rocker. Guess what? Noah went ahead and, and was obedient and did it exactly according to God's plan. What about if he said, Noah, make it 50 cubits long. Noah made it 52. What if he made it 47? I don't think he would have been blessed. God wants when you do something for Him, for you to do it exactly the way that He wants you to do it. Amen. If He tells you to do something, you do what He says. And try not to add to or take away from. Abraham. Think of Abraham in the, in the Bible. He was obedient to the point that the Lord came to Abraham and said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. I'm going to make you head, leader. I'm, gonna, you're, I'm going to use you, Abraham, in a mighty way. Great God. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pack your clothes. I want you to get your family, your cattle. I want you to leave. I want you to leave your house. I want you to leave your your land. I want you to do this, and I want you to do it for me. Okay, God, where do you want me to go? I ain't gonna tell you. What? I ain't gonna tell you. What do I go east or do I go north or do I go west or or do I go south? Abraham, just leave. Be obedient. A lot of times, God will tell us to do something. We have no idea why we're going to do it, how we're going to do it, or where we're going to do it at. But He says, I want you to do this for me. You step out on faith, and you can do this because I'm going to be your strength. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody ever had to do that? Yes, we probably a lot of us probably has had to do that sometime. Moses, who led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, said, God... I have a speech impediment. I, I stutter. God, God, you want me to go to Pharaoh? You want me to lead, lead people and, and I can't even talk? Can you imagine Mel Tillis getting up there and saying, Finger, fa, 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 you know, going through his, his, his pitch and then finally to get it out he had to sing it? <laughs> but can you imagine God asking you to do something that is plumb out of your character, plumb out of your comfort zone, Plum out of what you think that you're able to do, what did Moses do? He tried to make excuses like we do. He tried to say, God, <laughs> Aaron, you know, Aaron would be a whole lot better at this. Well, don't worry, I've got plans for Aaron. Aaron's going to be your spokesperson, but you're going to step out. You're going to do for me what I want you to do. Joshua. He won the battle at Jericho. Can you imagine God coming down and saying, Joshua, I've got something I want you to do. I want you to tear down those walls. I want you to go in and take that city. Okay, God. What do I use? Do I have bows and arrows? Do you want, you want me to use spears? You want, you want me to use... Uh, what do you want? What do you want me to use? And he said, I want you to take some ram's horns and I want you to get everybody together and one time a day for six days... I want you to march plumb around that whole city not saying a word. One time. Do that. Okay, God. No weapons. No 
No. No spears? No. Okay, God, I, I'll do it. Now, now, Joshua, on the seventh day, I want you to march around that city seven times. And I want you to take those ram's horns that the priest has, and I want them to blow them. And everybody that's going around, I want them to shout. Okay, how about the, how about the weapons? The, the weapons now? No, no. Trust me, Joshua. Okay, God, I'll, I'll trust you. So they, they started marching around. Everybody was yelling. The priest was blowing the ram's horns. What happened? The walls fell. Why? No weapons. Because they was obedient. And God took their mountain. God took their wall. And completely removed it. Amen. Plumb out of their way. Just like God did. Just like God. David. King David. At the time, Saul was the anointed king. Saul got mad at David. Saul was trying to kill David. He was searching for him. And guess what? God put Saul right in the place where David was. He fell asleep. He put his enemy right at his feet so he could take care of him and kill him and, and he would be saved. What did David do? Exactly what God wanted him to do. He just cut off a little parcel of the corner of his, of his robe and, and, and didn't harm him. Why? Because he did it God's way. Saul had a change of attitude, change of heart after he saw that David could have, probably should have, and wanted to do it his way, but no, he did it God's way. Jehoshaphat, he relied upon God and he was delivered from Judah from the Amicites. Paul, he followed God's will and I'm so happy he did because he opened up the salvation plan for Gentiles. For me and you, because of Paul, I'm saved today. Because he opened it up from not only just the Jews, but the Gentiles. And look at us today. We're going to heaven when we die. Amen. Amen. Look at Peter. Peter had spent all night fishing. He got in that morning, worked midnight, guys. Anybody ever work midnight? He worked midnight. He got. He, he was getting off. He, he cleaned up his, his nets. Got everything ready. Gonna go home, go to bed. Go to sleep all day. Then go back to work at next night. Jesus said, Peter, go fishing. But it's the heat of the day, God. We don't, we don't do that. Peter, I told you to go fishing. Peter was obedient. And what happened? Man, you talk about a drought of fishes. He caught fish like he had never caught before in the heat of the day. When you wasn't even supposed to be able to fish. When you wasn't supposed to fish. When he should have been home in bed. When he should have been resting. So he could go to his job that night. He was obedient. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. And God blessed him. Amen. You know often the first effect of obedience is not the blessing. Carolyn, when God told you that your foot was going to be healed, it wasn't healed right then, was it? No. It took a while. You know, God, I've seen God miraculously heal people immediately. Right then, right there. Sometimes He uses doctors. Sometimes He does it over a course of time. Sometimes He does the, uh, the grand healing where we will never have any more heartache. He takes us on to heaven, which is a grand and a glorious healing. But sometimes the, the first effect of the blessing is not anything but obedience, doing exactly what He would have us to do. But a lot of times it's, it's the suffering that we endure getting to where He wants us to be. Sometimes what God requires of us will initially lead us to pain. It will lead us to sadness. And we shouldn't assume that difficulty means that we've made a mistake or that we have failed or that He has abandon us. You know, I want to look at two significant examples of suffering as the result of obedience. Moses followed God's command 
to lead his people out of Egypt. Great. They, they, they was out of bondage. They was no longer slaves. They was no longer being dictated every single second of the day what they would do, what they would eat, where they would work, what they would build. They was free. What did the people start doing right off the bat? They, they started being angry. They started being grouchy. They started uh, looking at Moses and, and blaming him for where they was at. They was not slaves anymore. They was headed to a promised land. But guess what? They wasn't there yet. <laughs> they were still in some suffering. The Israelites, uh, they was delivered from the bondage. The people started complaining bitterly about the circumstances around them and what they was going through while they was in this desert place. And despite these and other challenges, Moses is known as probably the most important leader in the Old Testament. Paul obeyed God by preaching the gospel. We all know the story of Saul of Tarsus. We know where he was at when Stephen was being stoned. We know where he was at when the Christians were being persecuted. But uh, when God came upon the scene and Saul did exactly what God wanted him to, it was such a thing that he had to even change his name. He didn't want to be associated with uh, Saul of Tarsus anymore. And they called him Paul. But he suffered tremendous persecution. He suffered tremendous danger and physical abuse because of his stance for God. However, because he was imprisoned for what he believed. Now, did you get that? My gosh. He, he's doing exactly what God wanted him to do. Now he's suffering persecution. He, he's, he's, he's in prison. He's in prison because he's doing exactly what God wanted him to do. He was exactly where God wanted him. Where he was at, he had time to write Philemon. He had time to write some of the books of Colossians and Philippians and Ephesians. He had time to do this because his obedience resulted in a lot of supernatural things in Paul's life. God's purpose for our suffering. You know, a lot of times we think, well, you know, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm on my way to heaven. Surely God's going to bless me now and He's going to take me out of some of the situations that I'm in. But a lot of times God wants to bring us to the end of ourselves. You know, we have to become broken a lot of times before God can fix us. Because a lot of times we don't realize we're broken. A lot of times we have to come to... Anybody ever been at the end of the rope? What's at the end of the rope? Ultimately, where's he at when we think we're at the end of our rope? We're, we're ready to fall off the end of that rope. Nothing there. We, we see that we're going to drop. We're at the end of our rope, so we're at the end of ourselves. You got it right. God is at the end of our rope. He's at the end of where we think that we can take over and do it ourselves. When we finally realize, man, we're, we've got as far as we can do. Just as Sidney sung, it's not about us, it's about Him. It's going to be what He can do through our life. It's going to be Him blessing us. It's going to be Him doing the power in our life and not the power that we have in our life. You know, Paul obeyed by preaching the gospel. Moses obeyed by freeing those in, that was in bondage. And we see that Moses and Aaron and, and Joshua and all these people, they minded God. And it, a lot of times, you know, it's for the betterment even though we're going to suffer for quite a while. If you obey God, can you expect His blessings? Yes. Are we going to have a carefree life that's not going to have pain or persecution or temptations or, or sin or, or habits that's still going to pound upon our ship? We're still going to have those, aren't we? We're still going to have them because we're still in this world that they were still trying to get us and get us back to where we used to be. But in suffering, you and I have the opportunity to become living examples of the goodness of God. Amen. You know, as others watch how we respond to Him and when we're overwhelmed, you know, we got people watching us every day. They recognize Him through us. They recognize that He's working in us and through us, and they have a testimony of their own. If you obey God, can you expect 
His blessings? Yeah. Are they going to always be there? Yeah. Are they going to be uh, the physical blessings? Sometimes. You know, sometimes we struggle. You know, uh, Webster defines blessed as of or enjoying happiness. It uh, is something that brings uh, pleasure or contentment or good fortune to our lives. Simply stated, is it is that state of being that we all want to enjoy. Is there anyone here that does not like to have blessings in their lives? Anybody here never have had a blessing in their life? We all have, haven't we? And a lot of times we, sometimes we don't really realize it, but I guarantee there's not a person in this room right now that would sit there and say, I don't want to be blessed this morning. I guarantee you, every single one of us, we want to have God's blessings. And certainly we are a blessed people. Every single one of us. But when it comes to matters of blessings, we often view them in the wrong light. Most often we look at them as the physical things and, and the material things that are in nature that uh, God blesses us with. For instance, everyone that has their household doing well, you consider yourself blessed. If you have money in the bank to pay your bills, you consider yourself blessed. If you have a home and you have a, a good driving car, you consider yourselves blessed. We equate these physical things with being blessed. But I want to go a different route this morning. You know, I, I'd have to agree though, if we do have those things, we are, we are blessed. Out to where I work this past week, they laid off over half of the people. They lost their jobs, never to come back. And this one guy walked in and I, I thought he was probably on the borderline of maybe getting it or being able to stay. And he walked up and, and he's always a rough, rough guy. Man, he handles language. He, he's, he's, you know, to think, you know, he wouldn't have any weakness because he, he's big in, in stature and he, he's, he's a, just a, a burly man. He walked up with a tear in his eye and shook my hand. He said, Jeff, he said, I just want you to know it's been good working with you. I said, Steve, I'm sorry. I said, did you get laid off? He said, yeah, I sure did. He said, in fact, I'm supposed to, tomorrow's supposed to be my last day. But he said, I want to go out and start beating the bushes, trying to find another job in this economy. Bleak outlook, blessed. He's still blessed. He still has his health. He still has his thing. But man, he's, he's had his future ripped right out from underneath him. And I got to thinking about these guys that just got laid yeah. off and has have families and house payments and car payments and, and bills like every one of us. Man, to, to think what was going through their mind, that me and Tana's experienced it in the past. Been laid off in the past. But, but we, you have no idea what people right next to us in our own community are going through at this very moment. And how that they're not feeling blessed, but still they are blessed. There was Christians that got laid off. It just wasn't sinners. It just wasn't bad people that got laid off. It was good people. It was people that was living for God. You know, the rain comes down on all of us, don't it? But we had people that got laid off that was living for God and experiencing His blessings. How, probably this morning, right now, they're in such a, a terrible, sorrowful state that they don't feel blessed. But you know, they are in a certain extent. You know, whatever happens to us is going to happen. It's how we react to those situations. You know, what happens when a loved one is, is stricken with a, with a, a dreaded disease? We, we have people here that has experienced that. Did we cease to be blessed? What happens when we drive junk cars and our, our house is falling apart? Are we, are we still blessed? What happens when there's no money in the bank and no money in our pockets and and we can't pay our bills. Or, are we still blessed? Does that mean that somehow the Lord has stopped blessing us? And the answer is no. Our problem is that we tend to look at blessings in regard to how they benefit us naturally and, and, and uh, certainly materially. But a lot of times we look at these things and they are temporary. This, this earth is at best. The car is one day going to die. I don't care how new it is. Chris and Lori, them brand new vehicles, one day they're going to quit and die on you. Some of, us is, some of you that has beautiful homes, it's going to be in disarray, it's going to need repair. 
the older we get, our bodies is going to decline in health. Are we still blessed? Yes. Amen. We're still blessed. You know, our health is going to eventually decline. We we know what the real blessings of the Lord is. They're not material. They're not physical. The real blessings of God, according to this scripture, are spiritual. They're spiritual in nature, and these blessings will never be taken away from us. These spiritual blessings will never be taken away from us. Even when everything else is gone, these spiritual blessings is still going to be there. We're still going to possess them. You know, the quantity of these spiritual blessings can be summed up in one little word that is found in that verse 3. It says, all. A-L-L. All. You know, that word tells us that in the Lord we... We find every single thing we need to live the Christian life that we need to live. God has held nothing back from His children. Amen. Not one thing. I'm looking. I'm looking at a bunch of blessed people this morning. Whether we realize it or not, we're blessed. Amen. Blessed beyond measure. When He saved us, He saved us, and He gave us everything that we needed at that time to make it to heaven. When you were saved, wow. You know what you're saved from? Saved from hell. Right. Torments. You were saved from that. Now you have a blessed home waiting you in heaven. We have everything we need right now to be content, to be successful, to be obedient, and to be useful in God's kingdom and to be happy in Jesus. What qualifies us for these spiritual blessings? I'm going to close on this. The last two words of verse 3 tells a person what they must do to enjoy all of these spiritual blessings. Anybody still got your Bible open? The last, last two words. In Christ. In Christ. The only way for anyone to enjoy the spiritual blessings of the Lord is for that person to be saved by the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. At the moment of conversion, you are placed in His body. Never to be separated. Never to be worrying about hell again. You get in Christ when you get saved. When this happens, you are made a partaker of the spiritual blessings of the Lord. When you and I look at our blessings from the Lord's perspective, I think that we would all have to say this morning that we are indeed blessed. Amen. This morning, are you saved? Are you in Christ? Do you have hope of your future in heaven tomorrow? Many times we divide our altar up. And I'm going to do that again this morning. This side over here we have a lot of physical problems. We have a lot of heartache. We have a lot of family we're praying for. We have a lot of things going on in our lives that we need direction. We need God's help. We need His leadership. We need His voice to speak to us in such a way that when we come to this altar, we kneel down and say, God, you, you show me. You tell me what you want from me. <clears throat> and I'll be like Moses. I'll be like Aaron. I'll be like Jehoshaphat. I'll be like Joshua. I'll be like Noah. I'll be like Peter. I'll be like Paul. God, I'll do what you want me to do. Just show me. Show me. We use this section right here for the unsaved. You know, if you have not given your heart to God, man, this is the perfect opportunity. You have people here that loves you, that wants to see you go to heaven with them. It'd be a perfect opportunity for you just to come and kneel and say, God, forgive me for anything I've done in the past. Anything that I've done in the past that's displeasing in your sight, God, I just want you to know right now I'm sorry. You know what? Man, just like Emerald, bam, it's done. You get to go to heaven. And for those of you who are saved, and maybe you don't realize the power that God has for you and, and how that you can be an overcomer and live above these things that so easily besets us. We have this section here we use as a place to be set apart, to be sanctified. You know, it's God's will. And we're to do it daily. We're to sanctify ourselves daily. If you're not sanctified this morning, come and say, God, I'm bringing you that blank piece of paper. I'm going to sign the bottom of it. You feel it? 
Whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do it. I'll be obedient because I want your blessings. I need your blessings in my life. And over here, we use this for ministry. Some of you don't know what God wants you to do. You know that He's called you to do something. But right now, you're a wee wah woo know what that is, don't we, Janet? We had a message on that. It's the Chinese for somebody coming to some place and, and purposefully just sitting there not doing anything and in fact saying, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to come and just be a sponge. I'm going to be a wee wah woo If you don't want to be a wee wah woo you want, you want something to do in the church and you don't know what it is, or if you know what it is and you're not doing it yet, this right here would be a great place for you to come and just say, God, I'm giving you my all. Each section. Hurts and habits and family that you're praying for. Unsaved, the sanctified, unsanctified. The ones that need God's help in their direction of their life. We can all just say, I, I need to be obedient this morning. I'll do what you would have me to do. Let us stand.